Hi everybody, I wanted to make a video on free indirect discourse, especially for those of you who weren't in class the day we went over it. Um, this is really one of Jane Austen's most important technical innovations in narrative um, in how to capture the uh, interior world of a character in the novel. So let's take a look at free indirect discourse. So uh, let's start with the idea of narrative. Um, at the middle school level and really through high school, you've learned about point of view. You've learned about first person point of view, third person. You've probably learned about limited point of view and omniscient uh, narrator. Um, so uh, whether the narrator knows everything or just follows one character around. And then you've also probably learned about an unreliable narrator, somebody like Nick, who you can't quite trust. Those are all concepts that you should be pretty familiar with. So. At an advanced level, some other concepts and more subtle concepts that we talk about with narrative include um, free and direct discourse I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, focalization is another one we'll talk about where uh, that's where the narrator moves either closer to or farther away from the interior world of a character. Um, there's also the notion of implied author. Sometimes when the narrator kind of breaks away from what we think the author thinks, that kind of creates this separate notion of, of what we think of the author is actually thinking, um, which is something that, that, that um, sometimes writers use very deliberately. So let's talk about free and direct discourse. This is when the narrative itself takes on the thoughts and speech of a character without quoting. So the narrator or the narrative becomes the sp thoughts and speech of the character. It's free because it moves freely between the narrator's ideas and the character's ideas. It's indirect because it's not a quote of what the person said, but rather it's sort of characterizing their speech. And it's discourse because it is what the character is saying or thinking. So um, sometimes it's also called free indirect speech or free indirect style. So here's an example of that. This is from a book you probably recognize as Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, the first of the Harry Potter books, and this is the way it starts. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of Number 4 Privet Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Now this is the very first thing we hear from the narrator. Clearly it's the narrator talking, there's no quotes here. But when it says thank you very much in the first sentence, that's not really the narrator's voice, that's the Dursley's voice. When it says such nonsense, it's not the narrator who thinks that it's nonsense, it's the Dursleys who thinks think that it's nonsense. So right away we're getting not only the thoughts, but the very voice, the very sort of expressions of the characters in the narration itself. That's free and direct discourse, and it was invented by Jane Austen. So one of the books where she really brought it to full fruition is Persuasion, her last novel. It's one of the reasons I like to read her novel in, in this class, because it's technically so brilliant. So this is a passage that's a famous example of free and direct discourse. It's Lady Russell's um, pass. It's in pa chapter four. This is Lady Russell persuading um, Anne to give up her her engagement with Captain Wentworth, and so it goes through Lady Russell's ideas, and you can see the narrative takes on the voice of Lady Russell at the time. Let's listen. He thought it a very degrading alliance, and Lady Russell, though with more tempered and pardonable pride, received it as a most unfortunate one. Anne Elliot, with all her claims of birth, beauty, and mind, to throw herself away at nineteen, involve herself at nineteen in an engagement with a young man who had nothing but himself to recommend him and no hopes of attaining affluence but in the chances of a most uncertain profession and no connections to secure even his further rise in that profession would be indeed a throwing away which she grieved to think of Anne Elliot, so young, known to so few, to be snatched off by a stranger without alliance or fortune, or rather sunk by him into a state of most wearing, anxious, youth-killing dependence. It must not be, if by any fair interference of friendship, any representations from one who had almost a mother's love and mother's rights, it would be prevented. Okay, so just to look at this, I've highlighted in red, this is really what Lady, what Lady Russell would be saying to her. Um, it's Anne Elliot, throw herself away. You probably can imagine that she would have said something like it. It's got her speech like throughout it, but it's not quoting her. Um, 
So the narrative itself takes on this this uh, sort of set of ideas. One of the things that's interesting about it is um, I put in blue here. This really looks like all the reasons that she's going to lay out. So obviously she would have been kind of going through this with Anne and pressuring her with all these reasons that she has nothing to recommend him, no hopes of attaining affluence, the most uncertain profession, blah, 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 blah. This is like when your parents are giving you all the reasons they don't want you to do the thing that you want to do. And it ends up then with even the mother's love and the mother, almost a mother's love and a mother's rights. She's really kind of turning even the uh, sort of the emotional um, manipulation here, the guilt tripping here. Um, you can really see why Anne, at 19 years old, wasn't ready to throw off the you know the really earnest advice of of her mother's best friend and then her godmother. So uh, what's interesting, and this is again, that's a very famous passage. What's interesting is the passage follows then with sort of the the counterpoint from Captain Wentworth. Let's let's see what that says, and it continues then by taking on his voice a little bit. Captain Wentworth had no fortune; he had been lucky in his profession, but spending freely what had come freely had realized nothing. But he was confident that he should soon be rich, full of life and ardour. He knew that he should soon have a ship, and soon be on a station that would lead to everything he wanted. He'd always been lucky. He knew he should be so still. Such confidence, powerful in its own warmth and bewitching in the wit which often expressed it, must have been enough for Anne. But Lady Russell saw it very differently. His sanguine temper and fearlessness of mind operated very differently on her. She saw in it but an aggravation of the evil. It only added a dangerous character to himself. He was brilliant, he was headstrong. Lady Russell had little taste for wit, and of anything approaching to imprudence a horror. She had deprecated the connection in every light. Okay, so I've highlighted... Um, we have in blue here, this is Captain Wentworth's point of view. Yeah, he had no fortune, but he's always been lucky, and, and uh, he's going to be lucky again. Notice it's not quite exactly the same fully taking it on. It does say he knew that, he was confident that, but still we have very much the um, sort of the warmth of Captain Wentworth's point of view is is kind of taking over this half of the paragraph. and. And right in the middle, we have just a little sliver of what Anne thinks, and then we go straight back to Lady Russell. Um, even his sanguine temper, his fearlessness of mind, he was brilliant, he was headstrong. In her mind, those things which could be compliments are actually bad things. And we see in this paragraph Anne kind of squeezed between um, this very compelling Captain Wentworth and this very insistent um, Lady Russell. And, uh, and kind of her own wishes kind of squeezed out in the middle, which is really kind of, especially in the early chapters of Persuasion, the kind of thing that happens to Anne. So this is the way, um, this is a really good example of how a free and direct discourse works. It's a very um, useful tool. It's also very flexible. Uh, the narrator can come in more, come, come in less, can, can quote more, quote less, um, however she wants to do. So that's, that's an example of free and direct discourse.